Welcome to the first in a series of presentations on virtualization at Java, where we're going to focus our attention on memory. This first presentation is designed to establish the fundamentals of memory management right the way down from a Java application through the operating system and down to the hypervisor. First though, a quick introduction to virtualization. Virtualization removes the one-to-one -one relationship between a piece of hardware and an operating system. This is done using a hypervisor, which abstracts out the hardware layer, allowing us to create virtual computers or virtual machines. The hypervisor allows us to run many virtual machines on a single piece of hardware called a host. Virtual machines can be dynamically monitored, configured or isolated to provide enormous flexibility and guaranteed levels of service. And the runtime state of a virtual machine can be captured, stored, moved or copied as required. Given that physical computing resource is typically underutilized, moving workloads from physical to virtual can have substantial efficiency savings. However, there are other benefits, such as the ability to move virtual machines between physical hosts as they're running, or even to run multiple concurrent instances of the same virtual machine on different hosts for high availability. The clustering of hosts, combined with the ability to create arbitrary pools of resource that span those hosts, finally allows you to treat computing resource as a true commodity without boundaries. When we talk about the hypervisor managing computing resource, memory is one of those key resources that must be managed. Each VM has a certain amount of configured memory, or VRAM, which is presented to the guest operating system running in that VM. Changing configured memory used to require crawling around under a desk with anti-static gloves. Now it's just a simple mouse click. Powering on a VM, you can see that it consumes memory as it boots up. The hypervisor lazily allocates memory to the VM as it's needed. Granted memory is the total amount of memory that the guest operating system is currently using from the guest's perspective. And consumed memory is the actual memory footprint of that VM from the host's perspective. As we run an application, we can see that more memory is gradually consumed. Active memory is an estimation of the amount of memory that's currently being read from and written to by applications running in the VM. Resource pools allow available memory and CPU resource to be divided up into pools. VMs can be placed in those pools and are then bound by the resource constraints of the pool. When the VM is powered off, it releases all of its consumed memory back to the host. Now let's examine the levels of abstraction that exist between the memory managed by an application and the memory managed by the hypervisor. When an application needs memory, it asks the operating system for a chunk of a particular size. The operating system gives the application what looks like a contiguous chunk of memory with a start and end address. In fact, these addresses are virtual and give the operating system a level of indirection that allows it to satisfy those reads and writes from whatever physical memory that it has available. The hypervisor adds a further level of indirection to this story, which maps physical memory to machine memory, which is the real RAM in the host hardware managed by the hypervisor. So we have three layers of memory. Virtual memory, which maps to physical memory, which maps to machine memory. The application allocates memory from the operating system, which consumes memory on the hypervisor. As you can see, the top two layers are encapsulated within a virtual machine. A typical application when it runs will allocate memory from the operating system when it needs it and explicitly free the memory back to the OS when it no longer needs it. The operating system itself is responsible for juggling the physical memory it has available to it to ensure that the applications running on it have the memory that they need. It therefore needs a framework to keep track of which memory is allocated and which memory is free. The hypervisor has a similar challenge. It intercepts reads and writes to physical memory in the guest and maps those to machine memory on the host. Here we can see an operating system booting up and as it writes data to physical memory, the hypervisor provides machine memory to store that data. 
However, there's a separation of concerns here that's important to understand. The tracking of allocated and free memory within the guest operating system is not visible to the hypervisor. The hypervisor is not even aware of the applications that are running. All it sees is physical memory being written to and read from. So, what does this look like? Here you can see an application allocating some memory, allocating some more memory, and then freeing some memory. Notice how the hypervisor is maintaining the state of the freed memory. Now let's say it allocates some more memory, and the same thing happens again. Now the application is shutting down, but the consumed memory on the hypervisor hasn't changed. So we can think of a VM as being a black box to the hypervisor, constantly reading and writing memory. As you can see, this means that its consumed memory inevitably grows and grows. Now let's take a step back and look at the basics of Java memory management. Like most programming languages, Java has the concept of a thread stack and a heap. However, stack allocation is limited to just primitive data types, so most data ends up getting written to objects which live in the object heap. The object heap is a single, finite, and contiguous area of memory which is managed by the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM. One of the value propositions of Java is that memory in the heap is managed automatically. Objects are never explicitly freed, rather, they are garbage collected when they are of no further use. Garbage collection is simply a periodic process of housekeeping that is performed by the JVM when it starts to run out of space. A period of garbage collection may require all threads in the JVM to be momentarily paused until it completes. Since garbage collection has a cost, there are various different strategies employed depending on the needs of the application. A generational strategy acknowledges that most object data is short-lived, so all objects begin life in an area of the heap called the young generation space, which is regularly garbage collected. Objects which survive enough of these collections are tenured to an older generation space, where garbage collection is done far less frequently. Given that Java has its own framework for managing allocated and free memory, which is invisible to the operating system, there are some interesting parallels here with the black box relationship we looked at earlier between a VM and the hypervisor. Let's look at an example. The JVM starts up and allocates some memory for its own internal use. You can see how it's allocated the heap as a single contiguous chunk of memory in the operating system. Now, an application starts up and the JVM creates objects in the heap. As it writes to virtual memory, the operating system lazily backs that with physical memory. Now the heap is full, so let's say there's a garbage collection. The operating system has no idea that a garbage collection occurred, so while there's now free memory available to the JVM, the memory is no longer available to other applications running in the guest. One question that is regularly asked by customers is whether it's better to have the heap start small and grow over time, or whether it's best for the heap to be its maximum size on initialization. We can call this distinction a partially versus fully committed heap. Well, let's play through an identical scenario with both types of configuration and see what happens. We'll start with the partially committed heap. The JVM allocates some memory, and then some more memory, and now the heap is already full. Before expanding the heap, the JVM does a garbage collection, and here you can see it collected one piece of garbage. The newly allocated memory writes over the old garbage, and now it's not long before the heap is full again. So, once again, there's a garbage collection. Continuing this scenario, eventually the heap reaches its high watermark size. If we replay this exact same scenario with a fully committed heap, we see the objects being allocated, and now some of them have become garbage, but since a garbage collection hasn't yet occurred, the garbage hasn't yet been cleaned up. In fact, what happens is a single garbage collection, which collects all five pieces of garbage at the same time. So what effect has that had? Well, the fully committed heap had only one garbage collection, but it paused the JVM for longer than the four collections in the partially committed case. Also, the live data that remains is more fragmented, which may mean that the JVM needs to perform a compaction. Finally, the most important difference is that the fully committed case has now left a larger footprint on the operating system. In other words, it's consuming more memory, which it won't give back until it shuts down.
So, let's summarize what we've learned in this module. The ability to consolidate physical computers into virtual machines provides far more flexible administration, more efficient use of hardware, and the ability to arbitrarily create boundaries around computing results. We've learned about the layers of memory management between applications, operating systems, and the hypervisor. We've learned how a Java application manages its memory in the JVM. We've shown how the memory management which goes on inside an operating system is a black box for the hypervisor, so the guest operating system always ends up consuming its peak memory on the host. We've also shown how the JVM is a black box to the operating system in exactly the same way. In the next presentation, we're going to examine the various techniques the hypervisor uses to reclaim memory from virtual machines.